I seen him run through the hole. I swear, it's the loudest I ever seen, like, shoulder passing helmet. Collision. And all I hear is crack. And you ever, like, get frightened by a noise? Of course. <laughs> and I'm blocking somebody. I hear a crack. I was like, I was like, <laughs> you know, they can't really hit us no more. It's really, I mean, I look at it as in, look, you hit me, you losing money. How many yes. people want to lose money? Yes. So I run over there with a lot of concern, like, there you hit me. <laughs> <laughs> there you. Hey, yeah, look at you like, hey, I'm going to point at that I'm going to point your ass out. Hey, <laughs> <what's> up? <laughs> Season six, the first one in Toronto, 2018? Yeah. It actually does feel like a long time ago. Here's to season six. Let's make some more unforgettable moments. Only in the shop. Cheers. Cheers. I wrote a book, man, and I tell you, you know, if anybody else that never did that, it's one of the craziest processes ever ever, and I literally went on an emotional roller coaster. Cause um, it's called Lessons from uh, Papa. My grandfather got murdered my senior year in high school, right, by uh, five teenagers. And my granddad was my best friend. I mean, that was my, my right hand man. I lost my grandmother when I was eight, and my grandfather, he had the first black owned service station in North Carolina. So in my book, I'm talking about that. And through the process of writing the book, some of the stuff I hadn't talked about you had to relive it a bit. I had to relive it. And I did the audio for my book, too. So it was wow. one thing writing it. So I got videos of when I was doing the audio book of, like, just breaking down, you know, because it's like therapy, right? They tell black people, don't, man, you don't need to talk to about nobody. But this was like therapy for me. You know what I mean? So in my book, I talk about all of that. So it's dope to be able to tell your story. You know what I mean? So people, you know what I mean, get a chance to see the, the good and so, the bad that comes amazing. with it. What went into, like, that character, though? Because, like, me watching Snowfall, like, I thought it was real life. I, I fell in love with, with Jerome. Like, it, it just felt like real life. It felt like something that wasn't even a TV show. It felt like reality. Like, I'm from Harlem. Wherever y'all from, y'all know somebody like Unk, because I put that in the DNA of Unk. For sure. That this, this African-American experience, our, our uncles that, was, that loved us to the death, that would go rob for us, that'll, that'll, that'll love us, but will kill for us. That got an unapologetic look at who they are as black men. If, sure. I couldn't, if I couldn't impart that, which is really important to me, if I couldn't import that into this character, I would have failed. So more than anything, the fact that other black men can be like, hey, yo, that's my uncle. I'll never forget that we went in our jerseys to one of my parents' friends' house on the weekend. And you know, you when you go in jerseys, like back then we didn't have, like, I didn't know an edge control. Like, we were 10 years old. Check it out. You know, like, thank God for gloves. Your baby hairs were late. Baby, first, my baby hairs are never late. I Me still have not figured that I out. I was like, oh, <laughs> just a bunch, <laughs> just to break it down. I tried to lay them down, and then, like, these are African Shrimble 100%. On <laughs> so I'm like, I, I've just given up. But yeah, you know, we come to our parents' friend's house. I probably was like 10, and I'll never forget some of my parents' friends would look and they were like, sort of like, why are they wearing this? Like, do they smell? Why aren't they in the kitchen? Why aren't they helping out in the traditional expected ways? But my parents, like, I love the fact that they did not care what they said. We're getting all A's. They needed to put four girls into something that would make them tired so that they go to sleep at the end of the night. And all of a sudden, that transformed our lives. And so when I was in school, never being the girl asked to, you know, the dance, you know, because I didn't fit the mold of the Texas little girl, okay. right? But, you know, eventually we started achieving at a high level through hoops. And so, yeah, it's been, a, it's been like a, a shift. I know what it's like to feel like you go from zero to 100 because on air, you know, I started really getting my um, opportunities through SportsCenter mm -hmm. in like 2018. Mm -hmm. But SportsCenter, you're like sitting in a desk like this, right? 
And then we have the pandemic where we're doing everything yep. in a box. Yep. Yeah. And so all of a sudden I stand up and I'm walking and I'm wearing the clothes that I want to wear yeah. so I can represent who I feel I am. And everyone's like, hold up, she got body? Like me, I ain't grew up with no father. Like I always say like, me not having no love for my father, I said, I want love from the world. If I can't get love from my father, I'll make the world love me. And that's what I went and did. I went and made the world love me because I, I only wanted love from this one man and I couldn't get it. Wow. So I said, if I can't get it from you, I'm gonna make the world love me. So let me ask you this. So do you kind of owe him your career? Yeah. And it's a weird thing. Do you, do you think about that ever? Like, damn, yeah, maybe I, I owe him I like definitely do, because like, if he was in my life, he probably would have told me, hey, that, that social media thing ain't gonna work. Job, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, him not, you feel me? Yeah. Me, so do you think about that though? I'm saying? Absolutely. Like, that's, all a deep, the time. that's a deep thing you just said. Absolutely. I always think about it like, man, what if my father was in my life? His p opinion would have mattered more. He'd be like, man, that social media thing, or go get you a job. But him not being in my life allowed me to know. Like, what if you he didn't say now? that though? What if he was like, go ahead, do that? That shit gives. So, I mean, he just he just my sperm don't show the world, I never know. <laughs> yes. You know what I'm saying? Do you so, know him now? I, no, he live, in my, he live in my granddad attic. Like, that's what's crazy about it. Like, I, I only talk to him through the door. <laughs> you a dumb. <laughs> no, I think I'm <laughs> Yo, you for real? Yo, Yo this is scary. Where's your vision? Like when I when He's I got trying to do it. He's trying to do it. Yo, bro. bro. All right, man. Oh, wait, so do you slide him money under the door? Yeah, you slide him twenty dollars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go get him a little forty ounce. Forty, 40, 40 you know what I mean? <laughs> Like when I come over, I, I I literally hear him stumping up the stairs. He don't want to see me. I don't know if it's an embarrassment thing or what. Do you mean literally or no? Like I'm not for real. This is the real thing. My mom, my mom, we had gotten to the peak of it because I was in the house and. You know, I'm back from college, so I'm, you know, I'm in like 23, 24. Yeah. So I'm like, hey, hey, figure it out, figure yeah. it out. So I had kind of like that two-year break, and I love my mom for that because she really let me use the house as like a like a movie set. So you was making videos at her Man, friend. I'm talking about, I'm flipping the sofas, I'm putting oh, the camera. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm not going, yeah. no, I'm not going. Yeah. I'm, not going. Yeah. I'm not going to set, yeah. I'm sorry. But, but I would flip it back before she get home from work. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But sometimes she would notice like, where the hell is my stuff? Like, she would just be looking for random stuff and it, you know, but. I, I'm thankful because she did give me that grace period and let me pursue my dreams and was taking so care of So she got a piece. So she got a piece of everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you, you know. have to so support. She cut it. She's involved in the team now. Like I have a song that's the closest thing, or the furthest thing away that I can release. I released on my first album. It's called Learning, and it's talk about like the racism I went through growing up, uh, the child abuse, and all this. And that was like one of the first songs that I ever wrote when I got to Nashville. And that was like one of the main things that brought all my fans towards me. Um, not only me being different in country music and kind of opening doors for other people that are just white, but also just being vulnerable and, you know, letting people know I'm just real. And so, till I got to middle school, um, country music was all I ever knew. And then I started learning about Chris Brown and Usher when I got to middle school. <laughs> and that, you know, that well, was fire at the time. You just thought you was a white uh, Yeah, till yeah, a kid I didn't know. Called you, a you thought you was just a white Yeah, kid. dude. Really? I didn't know. I so that. I never met my dad. I didn't meet my dad till uh, I was 16. He called you? And he so, called you? No. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, like, yeah, come here, bro. No, but uh, my, my brother was white, my little brother, my mom was white, my nana was white. Never met any of my blacks out of my family. Uh -huh. And then uh, in middle school, seventh grade, uh, there was these two brothers that came, that picking on, my nickname was Bones. I was like 130, five foot seven. And uh, he told me, he was like, move out of my seat. And I was like, nah, I ain't moving, I'm, I ain't moving. So we ended up getting into a scuffle and then he was like, move. And it didn't phase me because I didn't know what it meant. Yeah. So then I went home and asked my mom about it and she got pissed. And then my, it took my little brother to come and tell me that I was biracial. Really? Man. And that's when I started asking about my dad. Wow. And then that's when that came up, and then I ended up meeting him when I was 16, when I was a freshman in high school. Uh, severe anxiety, panic attacks, um, depression. I, 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 was, I was on the verge of killing myself at one point okay. uh, during that moment. So, so I, I just took it on the chin. It took me time, uh, self-reflection. Therapy? Therapy, a little bit of therapy, self-reflection, and just understanding that you know, sometimes you go through things. It's just like a broken arm. You just don't see it. You know, you just gotta let it heal, and then all of a sudden you come back. Honestly, when I stopped hooping, bro, and like, I was depressed. I couldn't get out of it. Really? I, like, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to do nothing else but hoop. And like, feeling like for me for a long time, I felt like, and still now, I still, like, I feel like I, I can still hoop, but not being able to like do it on the level that I'm, I was expected or I expect myself to do it on. Not being able to do it at that level, it like put me in a depression because from high school, I was, I got drafted when I was 17. Of course. 
I'm 35. Like, this is all I That's know. That's your life. One thing I, I can openly say with confidence is that out of all my peers, I, I feel like I work the hardest. But I was explaining it to you earlier. I was, I was realizing I was using it almost as my vice work as a distraction because, you know, we all kind of go through things and even though we're working and, and you know, front facing, we seem okay. Like you were talking about, there's things internally that we have to work on. So I was using music, yes, as therapy, but also like constantly wanting to fill my schedule, constantly wanting to work as like the escape from the holes inside that was making me doubt my self-worth and mm. lacking confidence. And I feel like, especially all of us, I feel like we can say, people look at us and we think, they think we're confident, they think we have it all, they think because we have money in the bank that we're truly happy, but that's. Tia, in your new movie, there's a lot of pain, a mother and a child. How do you get, as an, as an actor, how do you get yourself? Because you could be having a lovely day, but then you show up on set and you have to, convey pain. How did you do that in the new movie? I mean, I just went back to what I was literally dealing with at that moment, you know? I was six months postpartum. So I was dealing with postpartum depression, um, and then just being back at home, like being back in my hood, you know, um, performing in Harlem. And, like, I lost a lot of friends and family, so I was going to funerals during my lunch breaks. You know what I'm saying? So Tuesday I was at this funeral, Friday I'm at this funeral, so it's just like, I had to take everything I was going through and kind of like put it into Inez, my character. Um, the hardest part was going home and flipping the switch and just being super mom, you know what I'm saying? Because I had an outlet. I finally had an outlet to be able to have my moment of weakness and just kind of break down, scream, yell, cry. So it was really easy to... to it's almost therapeutic? Yeah, in a way. Because, I mean, you know, having a newborn, it's never any real time for you, you know, to think, to cry, to everything's about the baby because you already panicking. And even though you already got a kid, when you have a newborn, it just still feel different. Mm -hmm. You know, like my oldest was six when I had, you know, my youngest. So I'm like, I don't remember half <laughs> <laughs> Is she okay? You just pamper, oh my God, you know what I'm saying? So you so occupied in just being mom and being a superhero all the time. You don't got time to think, cry, feel, or anything, you know? So I think that it was like, yeah, it was therapeutic to be able to go on set and be weak. I always think I'm the worst actor in the world. No matter what. Yeah, it's actually, I have a bad habit, so I developed this thing on sets where someone on the set and the crew, I don't care who it is, Crafty, the grips, the director, someone has to tell me, yo, you killed it. Really? Quietly, for me to be able to sleep at night. Wow. Mm, that's, because even... It's, well, it's, it's insecurity, right? It's, totally. it's insecurity, and, and they say let it go, but if, if I know that I didn't hit it the way I wanted to, it's a feeling. I don't really rehearse or anything like that. I work off the actor. Reading up on you, it's like you were an actor and a comedian, and, you know, and then you hit a phase or a stage in your life where you, like, drove Uber and, and worked, I believe, at Macy's, maybe. Or at Macy's right? first. What was that like when you think about, like, your journey of, like, you thought you'd pop off one way and then, you know, you figure out a way to make it about yourself and your brand. Like, what's that experience been like for you? I think um, the, the word fear is so real for me because for so long I was fearful of being me. So I had created this other persona. I created the Tabitha I thought that Hollywood wanted to see. You know, I'm from a small town in North Carolina, from Eden. And I'm Southern, I'm country. And so working in corporate America and then coming to the entertainment industry, I was always told I sound ignorant or you sound country, you need to cover your accent. And so I had mastered that so well that I almost forgot who I was, right? So I, I had to pretend all the time and wear my hair one way. I, I remember when I first got an agent, they were like, listen, with your skin complexion, you're gonna need to have your hair straight. So I was like, okay. And I believe that, you know, so. That happy. was a real conversation. Oh, absolutely. Me, absolutely. Lose weight, you know, in the last five or six years, uh, coming from a dark space of being sick, I had to really get to a place where I said, you know what, God, if you heal me, you can have me. And oh, I meant amen. it. And that was almost six years ago. Hmm. And in that, in, in saying that, something changed inside of me and I no longer wanted to be in charge of me. I wanted to be who he created me to be. Surrender. And I completely surrendered, mm -hmm. submitted myself to him. Insecurity is very dangerous. We all have it, right? Mm -hmm. It's how you manage it and how you mm. let it come and go. 
So you have to, but you have to either channel it or control it somehow, some way. How do you use it? I can't. I did a film with Liam Neeson when I first started acting. This is what started it. And I was doing the take, and I was doing it the same every way. I didn't know switch it up, right? So the director, he comes up to me and he goes, uh, Damson, uh, you are doing it the same every time. When an actor does the take the same every time, uh, this makes me sad. <laughs> <laughs> and then walks away. And then when we wrap, when we finish the movie, like, he goes, so, did you have fun? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my career's old. <laughs> no, you tortured me the whole time. <laughs> oh torture. Right? So that, that trauma always stays with you. I and get it. I you get know, it. they say it doesn't matter how big you get, you're always trying to prove yourself. You're always trying to train, you're always trying to get better. I find now I kind of need to audition to not only prove to everyone that I could do the job, but prove to myself that I could do the job. But as you get bigger, I'm in this place now where people are like, yo, come do this. Automatic. You know? Mm -hmm. So the nerves are there. I'm walking on. People are like, yo, damn, St. Idris is in this. I walk on set first day. I'm like... <laughs> Everybody get a therapist. Everybody <laughs> do therapy. I think it's really, it's really important and gives you perspective. Like someone, literally what my therapist does is she'll, she's amazing. And I wish I could plug her. But I can't. <laughs> but she will lead you. She will always lead me back to myself. I'll say a bunch of crazy, you know, a bunch of things. I'm going through the things that I'm thinking, I'm thinking. And she might even just sit there and be like, now, what do you think? I'd be like, now that I said it, <laughs> there's another perspective that I have about it. And there's something nice about having that bounce board that's skilled and has the tools to bring you back to yourself. And that's what I like about the book, too. It's like you open up that chamber being vulnerable. And I think you reap a lot of dope benefits from doing that. And, and, and the more we can encourage each other to do that, I think the better. The thing I've always been blown away by is that no one else in the world besides boxers will ever know the feeling of that walk from the locker room mm. to the ring. The ring walk, my favorite part of the sport. If you ain't mentally prepared for that, that's how you make you feel yourself. That's like, mm -hmm. that's a long walk. You can like, feel it in your stomach? What? You feel all that. Like, I mean, at this point now, it's like, I'm, I didn't did it so many times, so now it's like, I know what to expect. But if you, if it had been times where you get them bubble guts, yeah, you get them bubble guts. You, you, you want to turn around like, man, this, I'm going to turn around. I thought man. I wanted to do this shit, this shit it really ain't for me. I, yeah. I, 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 but I, wait, I, I appreciate you can admit that, because that's a human, you're oh, a human. Yeah. We all yeah. get that yeah. No matter how hard, how hard you train, how good you is, nothing can, can prepare you for that walk, like, but mm. just doing it. Yeah, you know what I'm it's saying? just going through it. It's probably the same when you go on stage. You, I was going to say that. Yeah, you might just To this day, I'll be like, a little bit. Really? Yeah. You know what I'm like, can yeah. I do this? Wow. Yeah. To this day. I know the same for you. For oh, you that, that's stand up a different beast. And, and yeah. with the stand up, like, you feel like, what if they don't even think this is funny? What if, like, exactly. you know what I'm saying? That's, like, that's what if they don't like, I done had that feeling, like, bro, because, like, especially if somebody rocking the crowd before you go out, oh. I'd be like, bro, I'm finna get up out of here. I don't even want to go out there. Man, that's hey. the same thing with boxing, because yeah. with, with, it'd be, it be undercar fights, and they'll go in there and slap. Yeah. While you, see, you see them coming in on a stretcher. Yeah. <laughs> it's real out there. I have, you know, two of the biggest songs in country music, streaming-wise, never got an award for them. Yeah. And uh, so I'm getting emotional, bro. Yeah. But when uh, all the Black Lives Matter stuff comes up, then I win an award, because I have a song called Worldwide Beautiful. Mm. And they're like, you, that's the most black people I've ever seen on a country music stage, was yeah. during that time, during the Black Lives Matter. And then I win my award. Yes. And I, like when I was accepting that award, it really pissed me off. That was probably one of my most, um, my darkest times, like my real dark times. Like people don't really understand. When like, the whole time in Minnesota, no, or that just last like year? towards like the end of my last two years, because like you don't know what it's like to go into a hostile environment or go to work and not feel comfortable. What was it in Minnesota that took you took you there? I just. I felt like I had potential and I didn't want to be an unsung hero. Like, I didn't want to be second fiddle to nobody. I felt like I believed in myself enough that I could, you know what I'm saying, lead a team. And you felt like you were second fiddle to Adam? Yeah. Or you felt like he was the number one? And yeah, you... that's, what, that's how I was slated. It was like they treated me like a number one, but then at times it kind of like they played me small. So it was kind of like a little bit of a mind game as well, like being young and just being there. And I felt like uh, it was such, it was a moment of like, of rejoice because I was like this, damn, I need to take 
my own life into my own hands. <laughs> in, in, in such a male-dominated field, how did you get the respect you deserve? And do you feel respected? I absolutely feel respected as a broadcaster. And I think that's because I have realized that people see you and judge you before they hear you and know you. And knowing that as a black woman speaking on the NBA a game that I will never play because I'm a WNBA player, mm -hmm. I was like, all right, if they already are coming to me and like saying, why are you talking on the NBA? Well, let me give you what you need to know. And so I usually Here go with facts, with figures. I'm the one that actually watches the whole games. You know, a lot of times Hall of Famers can sit down and just give you their opinions because they have earned that seat based off of their resume. But me, I have to earn my stripes. And so years of just, you know, putting out there the information, the breakdown, watching the game, people are like, she knows her stuff more than the guys. I'm really blessed that I've been able to have a group of people around me that I can call and be like, Mav, he been in rooms that I haven't been in. How can I, I never had that before. There is a moment right now that's happening that we are all doing things that were not prescribed for us. And it's crazy to see how all of us have kind of come from society's version of nothing and, and making it so much out of something, especially being influential and successful black human beings. And, you know, it's so cool sitting next to you. I know because we the girls in the room, so I'm like, yes. <laughs> I know. But Talking about shoe deals. Yeah. You've challenged Nike, and, and keep me honest here, when you were pregnant, I think there was a situation with Nike on maternity leave. Yeah, I went through kind of a, a really dark period. Basically, um, even before I got pregnant, I was offered 70% less than what I had been previously making. Mm. And there was a lot of fear even in starting a family because what I had seen in my sport was uh, women's contracts being paused. I saw um, them hiding pregnancies. Uh, so when you say contracts being what? paused, someone gets pregnant and your just sponsorship like is, wow. Yeah. Because you can't compete. Yeah. Wow, okay. And he said hiding in pregnancy, too. Wow. Yeah, so women were hiding pregnancies. And so when I found myself in that situation, I kind of felt like, well, I think I've accomplished enough. Like, at that point, yeah. I had been to four Olympics. I was a six-time Olympic champion. I was like, I think I'm safe. Like, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, you're like, but, I'm me. Exactly. Yes. I'm like, I, That's I, the point. Yes. Yes. Exactly. exactly. But I found myself in a very similar situation. And instead of, like, the financial fight, I turned my fight towards asking for maternal protections. And basically, the way that track and field contracts work is that they're performance-based. So you go to the Olympics, you get a medal, you get a bonus. Um, you don't, you get a reduction. So if you become pregnant, there's nothing in place to protect you. Wow. So I was essentially just asking um, for that. And I was actually told that I could have time for that, that um, that would be fine. But when the contract came back, there was no legal wording to tie it to pregnancy. And so that meant that it wouldn't set that precedent like, I would be okay, but all the other women that yeah. I had seen yeah. for years and years. Which is a big deal. You won the right there, exactly. Yeah. But I was terrified. You know, it's Nike. Like, of in, yeah. And I, we had a great relationship. I was You've proud of the You've been with them forever. Yeah, almost a decade at that point. Wow. Um, so it was really scary. But, you know, I came forward. I left over that. But um, they changed the policy after the op-ed came out. It was about two weeks changed. Later, and now yeah. they offer 18 months of protection. That's awesome. Wow. That's, awesome. That's, awesome. That's amazing. That's a big deal, by the way. I put a lot of time and a lot of time into my craft, and I watch myself. Like a lot of times, people get caught up in watching tape or watching somebody else. I like to watch myself so I can consistently be inconsistent with what I'm showing you. Like, I can't keep showing you the same thing. If I show you something, I'm gonna show you something different. And I wanna win. Like, you know what I'm saying, I believe in myself. Like, Y'all can attest, if you believe in yourself, it kind of, it sounds cliche. That's real. But I believe I'm that. So like, you know what I'm saying? I ain't never didn't think anything else. So when I go in there, I go in with the mindset, I'm trying to dominate. And most players get full off of ego, but you need to be full off of education because that's the real nourishment, right? You have to value expertise. Well, how about players who got max deals that the players looking at the kid going, Why'd he get a max deal? He ain't even all up. Well, that's the worst part about our business. Comparison. Comparisons are the thief of joy. You cannot do yeah. that because it's all situational. The whole point of life is to, in business is con continuing to get bad attempts, right? We, you cannot hit a home run without an attempt. So I try to explain to guys, this may be a single for you, or you may can hit a double. You know, but we get back up to play. Most entrepreneurs don't understand that line. Mm. When the getting's good, 
Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. You don't rap. You don't, you're not in entertainment. You're not in sports. People will run towards being an entrepreneur. I hear it all the time. <laughs> they have no idea. I remember when I went to an event last night. I wanted to leave immediately. Mm. Because it reminded me of I would fly to a room five hours, not know anybody in the room, and hopefully meet one person. Always. <laughs> I mean, hopefully. Yeah. Leaving that my turns family, into something. Hopefully leaving, leaving my family, flying five hours, staying in some whatever accommodations I could find, would lead me to one meeting, one person that would lead me to a follow-up. Yep. And that's how I started my career. That's a bar. That's, that's the ugly truth. People ask me, what's the secret? I don't sleep much, and I don't see my family much. That's the secret. That's where I relate it to like, a person like Ja. At the end of the day, bro, you're going to stop playing ball. Yeah. We all going to, it happens. I thought of it too. I was 18, 19. <laughs> I ain't crazy as hell over here. I'm going to be windmilling forever, bro. You going to stop playing. <laughs> the game, the ball stops. It's inevitable. Father time is inevitable. And at the end of the day, more than, what's more important than how much money you made, how many championships you won, to me, if, you, if somebody can sit there and say, you are a respectable man, then that's, that's all I need to hear. Did that, we went to Netflix with that movie. Love the script, came out. They were like, I don't get it. They were like, you know, it's, this is a walk and talk. That's, and, and you know, in TV terms, that's kind of like a, in movie terms, that's kind of a diss. They called it a walk and talk. They offered us a certain amount of money. That was like, we can't make this. They were like, you can have it back. We took it, we took it out. Immediately, the way you do reads, you do a weekend read. People have to read it and they've got, we got five of the biggest offers from all the major studios. It came back, Stuber and Ted being the executives they are, they were like, come back to us. And they gave us a lot more money to do it there. And I couldn't have done it anywhere else. But it was, the idea of it, it was not seen because it wasn't what, what they're used to seeing us as. Mm -hmm. It's never going to be that until you do it. People didn't see it until they saw it. You know what I'm saying? And then once they see it, they're like, oh, yeah, that's what it is. And it wasn't until I got sick and thought I was going to die. When I, when I said it earlier, when I said, God, if you, you heal me, you can have me, that meant mm -hmm. now I got to start showing up as the real tab. Because it's exhausting to show up as somebody else every day that's not the real you. And God can't give you what he want to give you if you ain't you. Right? So I had to get to that place. And when I started showing up as me, I was very afraid. Mm. Allison, I, w I wanted to ask you, you are, I believe, the most, by medals, the most decorated track athlete ever, correct? Female. Yeah. Okay, can we, can we at least, <laughs> let's talk that up. That's crazy. Right? Was, was every win as important as each one, like every medal? That's a good question. I feel like at each point in my life, I was like learning something new. And so I was still passionate, they were still important, but they were all different. Like my last Olympics was my fifth Olympics, my first as a mother. And I won a bronze individually, a gold with a relay. And that bronze medal, I think it means more than any gold wow. because it was like overcoming all the adversity, like being a representation for women, for mothers, like it just, it was everything. You know, I got to do it in my shoes that my company made. So it was wow. like full circle, all the things. Where do you yeah. keep your medals at, by the way? Uh, my parents keep them. Yeah. The I've never been into like the medals, but you know, yeah. they, parents, they like to brag and bring them out and all that mm -hmm. stuff. I'd, I'd have mine on during the show. <laughs> so like jewelry? For sure. Like jewelry, B? For sure. I'm that's like, sorry, T, what were you saying? I'm sorry, we to the side. That's the New York in you, bro. Sure. Can you see the crowd when you're Tumbling, flipping, 100%. moving. 100%. And, Whoa, and that's something, like, I haven't been able to recreate that feeling ever since. It is a drug, right? So, like, I'm there, and I love feeling the energies, like, the crowd's energy. And so it kind of gives me life, for sure. And that's how, like, the routine that went viral, I could feel everyone zoned in. Not a single other person was going during the meet. And everyone was just, like, captivated. And I, 
when it was silent, it was silent. And when it was loud, it was loud. And you heard it during the routine? During the routine, yeah. I know your wife also manif manifested it, right? She yeah, was... she manifested it. How did your wife manifest? She told me I was gonna, we would, we would watch Curb Your Enthusiasm. We loved the show. And we would watch it all the time. And I said, I would love to be on the show one day. And she said, you're gonna be on that show one day. I can see you and Larry together. Wow. And it just was, this thing that was supposed to happen in that way. Mm. So you believe in manifesting or was it Everything that happened to me right now, I've manifested. Love that. That's I saw you talk about every... literally your car. You said you used to walk to work. I've... Nine months, she just used to walk to work. I, when I was a kid, I said I want two vehicles as my dream car. Being a girl from poverty growing up, yeah. I said I wanted an X6. Because in Jamaica, X6 and Beamer is like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I want an X6 and I want a Lambo. I got both. Manifestation, that was one thing that yeah. I did a lot. I journaled a lot and I wrote a lot of things. Um, and one thing that I saw on Facebook today, 11 years ago, today I wrote something like, uh, I hear six, gun uh, six gunshots out my window while I'm trying to sleep. No wonder why I run from bullets in my dreams. And I said, like, um, all I could see is my Brooklyn residency. No wonder why, like, Sunset Boulevard seems so far from me. Oh, wow. But now when I did Swarm, Literally, my face was everywhere in Hollywood. It had the biggest billboard on Sunset Boulevard. And I wrote this uh, when dope. I was in East New York being like, damn, the bullets. The bull I'm working at the movie theater, have to work on Friday nights and, and come home Man. from Manhattan um, to East New York at like four o'clock in the morning, cold and being like, this is actually dangerous, but I can't, mm -hmm. I yeah. can't even think about that because I have to do it anyway. And just remember being like, oh, I can't wait till one day I'm gonna be on the screen, I'm gonna be, you know, yeah. and I just put a lot of energy towards that. Mark, if, if there's one thing that you could tell young Mike, that nine-year-old, yeah. what would it be? What it gonna work. <laughs> oh, boy, it's gonna work in a big way. Boy, you gonna have a big house. You gonna have all the old school cars you ever wanted. Boy, five. The women gonna come to your show. <laughs> your girl gonna be so hot. Like, it's hard to convince a child something's impossible. Mm. And I it's believe that- It's hard to convince that a child that something's, yeah, something's impossible. That's so true. Real. Yeah, it's hard yeah. to, you can't convince a child that, that, they, can't. that they can't fly. Right. Otherwise, you don't have the right brothers. So just eliminate the impossibility and let the child figure it out. Yeah. Let the child fall, let them stumble, let them, let them have to figure it out, but encourage. My mother didn't put me in the studio. She just said, yeah, you wanna be a rapper? Get you a rapper. Because <laughs> she was only 16 years older than me. She was like, nah, you can be a rapper. So when I got the opportunity, I didn't think it was impossible. I, I thought possible. So that nine-year-old kid, I'm just going to say, you know, don't stop. But don't turn down opportunities to do other things. Right. You know, don't turn down the opportunity to learn to do something else. Even if you aren't the best at it, you've been exposed to it. Straight and that's up. a beautiful thing. There's nothing more beautiful than a, than a well-traveled human being. When you got to the league, did you, what was the first hit when you was like, oh yeah, this is different than college? Um, actually, it wasn't even me that got hit. So it was my first year in the league and it was Adrian Peterson and Cam Chancellor. Like, so we was in the playoffs, actually. This was Minnesota versus uh, the Seahawks. Seahawks, So yeah. Seahawks was still had the Legion of Boom. They still oh, had some yeah, pieces yeah, yeah. in it. They still was spicy. I was a youngin' out there. I was like thugging. Like, I'm out here, so yeah. I'm supposed to be out there. <laughs> <laughs> I seen them run through the hole. I swear it's the loudest I ever seen, like, shoulder pass and helmet. Collision. And listen, I'm like, I can't see it. I heard it. So you're blocking. Oh, you're here. I'm fake blocking. You know how I mean. <laughs> So I got my hands on somebody. You know what I'm saying? You know, you got a little relationship with the DV. They don't want to tackle. Yeah, they don't want to tackle. You don't want to I'm touching. I'm pushing them a little bit. And all I hear is crack. And you ever, like, get frightened by a noise? Of course. And I'm blocking somebody. I hear crack. I was like, I was like, <laughs> I was like this. Oh, my God. You was like, like, oh, this is different. It was crash course, and then they kind of like stalemated, it, and then they kind of like fell like to the side. Wow. I was like, this. yeah, this, this, oh, this is what it's all about. Yeah, right? this is real. You know, they can't really hit us no more. You can't really you hit can't, a receiver, no. and it's, it's really, I mean, I look at it as in, look, you hit me, you losing money. How many yes. people want to lose money? Yes. So I run over there with a lot of concern, like, <laughs> there you hit me. <laughs> <laughs> there you. Hey, hey, look at you like, hit me. Hey, I can point at it, I can point y'all. <laughs> it could have been if he got paid 200 for a show, how much did we get to take? Ah, uh, man, like, I, 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 I like to sign up a lot of artists on the 99 one. <laughs>
Oh, imagine God. if you had that cut, Rich. What's the problem? God, and, Lee. God, Rich, know, imagine if you had that cut. You know, and I and I feel like that's showing love. <laughs> I, I feel like that's. I don't see a problem with it. I I, I feel like that's showing love. But 99 you know, yeah, one. Ninety nine one. So one your way, ninety nine their no, way. No, ninety nine my way. You get oh. to retain the one. All my family is from the hood. So for me, every day, like I got. I got 12 aunts and uncles on each side. Everybody got five, on each six side? kids. Yeah, so. 24? Yeah, so it's like. That's a lot of first like, cousins. No, I got like. That's a lot. I got, I got a, lot. a lot of first cousins. I got a lot. <laughs> my dad got six, and my mom had two siblings. I got like 25 first cousins. Oh. Two it's it's actually too many. It, when you, it is. You when you're black and make money, it's too many. You <laughs> cannot love that many people. You <laughs> <laughs> said you cannot love that many people. <laughs> it's too many. So, so in the beginning, it was, I was very fearful. So if you go back and look at like all my old videos, cause I, I cooked live every day at five o'clock. That was like, I, I made it like a job. I wasn't making no money. Listen, I would be cooking live some days, I would cry cause I'd be like, the Lord said thousands of minutes is 33 people on here, you know? And my husband, you would never see him, but you would hear him. And he'd be like, man, you got them people looking in our kitchen, doing these videos. And I'm like, I'm trying to be obedient to what the Lord has told me to do. That would've been me too, 100%. <laughs> I mean, listen, now that you've retired him, he could've shut <laughs> no, but listen. back then, I would definitely be like, man, you bring all these people. Hey, look, after the first check came, he was like, don't you need to do one of them videos today? <laughs> hey, almost 5 o'clock, ain't it? Right. Almost 5 o'clock. I roll it up, I put it on my back, Randy picks me up. Randy's in cut a... Cut to me and Jay chilling, drinking chilling. Yeah, mimosas and stuff. Right. Mimosas and like... Yo, what time's this kid gonna get here? <laughs> Randy pulls up in a two-seater Benz. The painting is huge. Huge. Right? I have to stick it out. It's hanging out the, 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 the little back, the little triangle window, yeah, right? <laughs> we drive it over there. I'm nervous as hell. First know, person I see you in the house. It's hanging out. It's, it's a baby mama Benz. Okay, okay, but still. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's Where, hilarious. The painting is longer the than the car. Yes, it's huge. <laughs> the painting is longer had than the car. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> first person I see in the house is B, and she's in the kitchen just chilling, eating a salad. That threw you off. Bruh, of course. come on, <laughs> come on. So now I'm, I'm tightening up, I'm chilling. We didn't know each other, but I knew of the, you know, obviously, the, you know, the whole squad. The only person I had met was Randy and Rich at the time. So we get out there, again, it's Jay. Jay, they don't have no shoes on. Jay's he's, chilling, he's he's lounging, he's super comfortable. Home. We're at the pool, we're sitting yep, at the pool. Yep, yep. Yeah. And so he's like, you know, we talk for a minute and I kind of tell him, the inspiration behind the piece. And he's like, yo, that shit is dope. He's you like, unrolled it. Yeah, and I... And the only thing I'm thinking about, I'm like, it's a dope piece. But how is he going to roll that back up by himself? <laughs> right. I was just like... By himself. I mean, I'm not helping <laughs> it. <laughs> not, not my problem. <laughs> I checked the account balance, right? So we go in. I have uh, my guy, Jetson, who, who produced the song, Shook. He met us at the studio. And this is the first song that I do that day. If you check out, you know, the words to the hook of the song is... Uh, I just signed a deal, I'm on. Yeah, of course. Yeah, That's yeah, what that was my mood. Well, yeah, I'm I was up now. On. Yeah, yeah, now nah, I'm in there. Almost give me a chill thing. It's I just up, signed a deal. You know what I'm saying? That feeling, we all in zone. That's what it was. I just popped my <laughs> for two minutes and however many seconds that song is. I literally was just, you know, when I say, uh, don't make me go hit the bank and check uh, and uh, take out a hundred to show you my pockets was different. The day before, I couldn't have went to the bank and <laughs> took out a hundred. The second I could talk to this, I talked. <laughs> so the, the callback was basketball. So I was like, man, I'm about to go crazy in this basketball <laughs> shit. I got this. Nobody could dunk. Nobody yeah. could even do no kind of real hooping at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. So I was in there literally like you see in the movie, pumpkin mugs. Cause I'm from Chicago, so I was a little rough, you know, in there, right? And especially that time in my life, I'm probably more incorrigible than, <laughs> than the rest of everybody. Uh, influenced by my, you know, in my Chicago uh -huh. environment. Mm -hmm. So, man, I'm talking about I'm taking off. Boom, pushing. <laughs> and so, like, when I play on boom, and I'm pushing on the ground and stuff. Literally, Jeff Pollock, who was the director, rest in peace, he came running on the stage, mm -hmm. literally. This is how I found out I got the role, right? He ran on the stage, like say you me, he ran on the stage. The director ran on stage, you got this, you got this, you got this. You got this. <laughs> I said, oh, <laughs> then I leave, man, and I'm on the A train in New York, and I'm going home like, man, this is the 90s, ain't no, ain't no, like, I, yeah, you know, all this, all this crazy yeah. shit, ain't, I can't wait to tell my, like, my OG, I'm gonna tell my mom what's going on, and, uh, my mom received it like, oh, okay. <laughs> and show me a movie mug. It's what, but show me a movie. I came in the league when I was 19. But I had $151 in my bank account as a college student. Wow. I declared for the draft, got an agent. The agent offered me 100,000 upfront money. 
right? Luckily, I had two parents who right. they was like, that's too damn much, right? <laughs> right? But they said 25,000, cool, right? So you know what happened? I was at Wake, right, in Winston. I went to the bank right up the street just so I could see what uh, the statement looked like, <laughs> yeah. right? Because yeah. we, we young, we don't, yeah. we don't know. Yeah. We ain't never had no money like this. Yeah. I went and got the statement. That Said 25,151. <laughs> <laughs> right there though. No education came along with it. Mm -hmm. Right? First thing I did, I went to the mall. Of course. Took my girl to the mall. Jay Gray and his girl went to the mall. We went to the Ball. The, what? Ball. What? <laughs> what? Ball. We went to the we went to Ball. we went to the clothing Ball store. The we went to the clothing store. I said, everybody get you something. <laughs> <laughs> right? I remember I got my first check. It was How crazy. It was like, I, I was grown at this point. I was like 20, but I hadn't seen that kind of money before. <laughs> um, and it was like, you know, I got like, it was like maybe $130,000 in a check or something like that. And it was just crazy. And it was like this car that I really wanted, you know, like, I, and it was just like, that was the only thing that was on my mind. Like, I have to get this car. And, you know, I didn't have credit. I didn't have anything. I walked into the dealership with a duffel bag full of money yeah. and just set it on the counter. Like, here it is, is an exact amount for how much the car costs. And then they, they counted all the out. And I'm sitting there watching them count it out. And then I, I drove off the lot and I was broke. So I had my car. You had your car. What do you do like to keep your this this park like tight like that? I don't know. I'm always like training. My, so my don't yeah. even come. Yeah, like, 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 we, I never see. He always in shape. You yeah. never. Yeah, so like yeah, when you not I'm train always, for a fight, do you eat crazy? Like you gonna go yeah, get I eat whatever I want. I, yeah, well, I can eat whatever I want. Okay. But you. But I've been work working out. Yeah. And I've been working out since I was seven, eight years old. Like I never. Even if you're not in camp, you do something every day. I'm always working out. Like, you do something like, every day. I just, I just gotta work out. Like it's therapeutic it, for me. I you know what? It. It's, it's actually a drug. So yeah, you get a release like, of yeah. chemicals. As, like, I'm, as I'm hearing them talk, I'm like, really, that's what I've been doing wrong. No I haven't been chemicals. working out every day. <laughs> I don't get no release of chemicals. <laughs> no release of chemicals so telling me to quit. <laughs> After you work out. I don't. <laughs> I don't. He said work out is the diet. Yeah. Said, I don't work out, bro. If I'm going in a room, you know, for a movie, a TV show, my rule of thumb is this. I go in big. I go in big. You know why? Because they could always... When you go big and they tell you, Oh, that was great. Pull back a little bit. Everybody knows how to pull back a little bit. Good one. But you go in low, and they say, you don't know how, how much. Now you're doing so much that they're like, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> got some bars. Hey, man. We you in the studio? I'll be what in the I... studio, bro. I got a whole song out with Boosie Bad at right now. What was it called? It's out right now? Right now, it's been on iTunes for like a year. Play it really? real quick. Oh, I oh, just, you wrote it, it just yourself? Spit it. Just spit it. We oh, no, it's going to come we, right we, now. We, 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 <laughs> it won't be too long at all. <laughs> you got it? Right here. Let's do it. You got no minutes? Put on your mic. Stupid! Oh, no. Crazy! Y'all didn't want me to do it, right? Ha, ha, ha! This is the worst song I ever heard. Yo, yo, ayo. Throw that shit away. Is this really all? This ain't serious. Fuck is you doing? Running up in your shit, nigga. I don't give a fuck. I'm about my cash. Hell no. I'm about my motherfucking. You can't hoop. You say what? You can't hoop. Bro, no, you can't hoop. I'm looking at you. That don't see, they see, they, they're sponsored. They be looking at people thinking they, and they get in the ring and they pop out and they got knocked out. <laughs> then they did. <dead. laughs> <laughs> 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 <laughs>